Hello there. there. Hello everyone, and welcome to Etlan. For today's video, I have something very exciting for you all, which is a collaboration with some fellow YouTubers. A couple of months ago, YouTubers Enchantarium, Dolinx, and myself were reached out to by Delightful in hopes of creating dolls to represent an alien space crew. With all of us having very unique and distinct styles, this should make out for an exciting design adventure. Before we get started on creating my alien, make sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video if you like it, and comment. I love reading through all of your comments. With that all being said, let's get started on creating our alien. To help inspire your own starfaring beings, it can sometimes require you to look at your own world and the creatures that you coexist with. Sometimes the most alien appearing creatures to us are just products of their own natural world. We twist and we morph to match our environments. When I started brainstorming the ideas for my alien, the strangest of things happened. Inspiration kind of hatched, so to speak. Eggs from my partner's old spiny leaf stick insect hatched after eight months of gestation. While to some they look scary, dangerous, and somewhat alien, these little creatures are perfectly suited to their leafy world. Taking inspiration from these new little critters, I moulded my own alien creature on the idea of a dense botanical world and the creature that is developed within it. My alien will have long muscular legs, initially developed to allow them to jump and run through the canopy with ease, with tiny feet to minimise the noise of movement. In creating my character, I must first choose the base. In searching for a base, I was so, so lucky to stumble upon a listing for parts from the Create a Monster series from the Monster High range, released in 2012, I think. In this lot, I got two bodies and a bag of head and hair. Gosh, that sounds absolutely morbid when it's out of context. <laughs> head number one is a green reptilian mold with carvings into the vinyl. Head number two is a grey vinyl with its mold with moderately sculpted features. Head number three is a blank mold in green vinyl. I am not sure what happened to its face. It looks a little bit off center there. For this character, I think I'll go with the reptilian mold. Popping the head onto the body, I really didn't like how bulky the head looked, and I knew this would end up irking me the entire process. So you know what? I'm in lockdown. Let's do a really fun project. Let's create a new doll body for this alien. To keep the essence of the doll's original body, I'm going to be using a 3D rendered Monster High body as the base. But we'll be modifying it by bulking it up and making it compatible with the new limbs and overall design. Using my Prusa filament printer, the alien model can finally become tangible. While through editing, it can definitely seem as if this worked our first try. However, through this project, I accumulated something that I have now affectionately called my fail draw. This project was a continuous cycle of print the model off, see its compatibility, and see how it works, edit the model, and then repeat. So you can imagine how excited I was seeing this coming together finally. In moments like this, you can see I'm not happy with a particular aspect of the model. In this case, I didn't like how loose the pelvis joint was. I knew this would end up becoming something that I didn't like over time. So I decided to replace it with an elastic structure.
To make this, I'll be mapping out and drilling holes from the front and back of the thighs, grabbing some small nails that I got from Bunnings. These will be the doll's new bones, so to speak. When adding nails to the model, I'll eventually thread elastic through that structure, through the torso, and again out the opposite side of the other leg to keep the model together nice and tight, but will also allow articulation. Time to clean the model. Using 100% acetone and a cotton swab, I'll start smoothing out the print lines. The chemical reaction of the acetone ever so slightly melts the plastic from the filament, which in this case will smooth out any imperfections in the print. From my stock box, I was able to harvest this neck peg. This will make sure that our doll's head will be poseable once it's reattached. For the limbs, I'll be using joint keys and arms designed by Rick the Gaijin on CG Trader, with which I purchased and got licensing to use. Modified from their model, I removed the pre-existing articulation with the intention of adding something a little bit more sturdy for longevity's sake. In this failed attempt, you can see I made the holes way too large compared to the test wire, making the joint floppy and unable to hold a pose. Using my smallest drill bit, I'll make holes in the new print. Once the nails are in place, I'll snip off the excess metal with some pliers. Something that I noticed that was becoming an issue over time was the shoulder connection. I wanted to make sure that it was sturdy and would stand the test of time. So we'll be attaching some magnets that will hold the joint in place, but will still allow range of movement. And it looks like we're done with the construction of the doll. So now we can get into the really fun part, the customization. What's a space themed character without a spacesuit? Time to create. Instead of creating the spacesuit through the computer, like I did with the body, I wanted to create it with cheap and easily accessible items that can be found at anyone's local craft or fabric shop. For my character's spacesuit, I'm going to be creating it out of EVA foam. The first step in creating this is making pattern pieces of the body. To do this, I wrapped the body in cling wrap and then tape.
Once the body is all nice and covered, I can sketch out a rough draft of the design. Once I'm happy, I can cut the design free. After tinkering with the design off camera, I was able to create these flat lays that I've drawn directly onto the EVO foam. Of course, while it totally seems as if this is a pretty standard creation, this section ended up taking me at least, I think about a week of on and off trying. I ended up moving down to my dining room table and just watching TV and just going back and forth modifying the design. Things like this have due process and will take a while to get things right. So it's important not to beat yourself up when it doesn't work out the first time. Just grab a cup of tea, pop on your favorite show and try your best to just enjoy the creation. Once all my pieces are cut out, I can start assembling them on the body. Grabbing my tape, I'll just start pinning the pieces onto the body, nice and taut, until I'm happy with the placement. Once I was happy, I can start setting the style in place. EVA foam is such a great material to create fantasy armour or sci-fi clothes. When it's heated, in this case using a hairdryer, the material will mould to the shape that you place it in. Now the foam is all shaped, I can start gluing the pieces together partially and temporarily string the doll together to see how it's all looking. Doing this, I can definitely see that I do not like the leg and hip attachments at the moment, and it looks a little bit silly. With some Milliput off camera, I was able to fix this by building up the hips and shoulders. Once I was happy with how everything was looking, I can start prepping for the painting. Heading to my garden, where I've made this makeshift paint box, I'm going to prime the pieces with plastic filler primer. This can be found at any mechanic or automotive shop. I did about two or three coats of this primer, just to make sure that I had a really good base to work with. While that dries, let's move on to the head. 
When designing this doll, I of course got carried away in creating a story surrounding this character and letting the story and world itself guide the design. In developing this character, a surprising baseline of inspiration came from horror-based media. The position of my character within the crew is that of the botanist. While it may seem relatively strange and out of place in a spacefaring crew, I want to base my character on the idea of rapid change and evolution in the natural world. In which this character finds it their mission to research and monitor such changes on other planets throughout the solar system. In regards to the horror-based inspiration of this, I took inspiration from films such as Annihilation and literature from H.P. Lovecraft's The Colour from Out of Space. Both media explore the idea of mutation and a rapid environmental change that occurs after visitation from omnipotent alien beings. How this is reflective of my character is the idea of their homeworld and physiology being based on this media. I wanted their homeworld to be quite a scary place for people to visit. Dark from the densely packed forest surface, that plants can change and splice, trapping any unwitting adventurer in the endless claustrophobia of trees. My character's species develop to live in this harsh environment. A most notable feature of their species is their camouflaged skin that can change colour on a whim. In the same way as a cuttlefish, this will be represented through my character's facial markings. To start creating this on the doll, I'll start mapping out the facial markings in a light grey. To do this, I gave the face a spray of Mr. Super Clear Matte Varnish. I will be using Faber-Castell watercolour pencils and soft pastels to give this doll its new face. I'm not gonna lie, the idea of the colour changing face was an ambitious issue. <laughs> The issue was that I had no idea how to achieve this in the terms of the painting. In the initial design, I had the idea of blending pinks, purples and blues into the facial markings. In the first face-up attempt, you can see that I'm trying very hard to do that, um, but I just wasn't able to do it, unfortunately. You can see that I did, I did try and give it a go. But I feel as if my overall understanding of colour theory and how to incorporate this into my design is very much lacking. I know that a lot of my designs can come out as monochrome and mild in colour. While I do try and overcome this, I've come to realise that everyone who creates it has strengths and weaknesses, and this just so happens to be one of my weaknesses. After a day or two of meticulously building up colour on the face, I decided to just try again, this time just staying in a very limited colour palette of blue, white and black. In creating this face up, I couldn't believe how many layers of varnish I had to use. Normally I do about 4 layers or so. This was 12. To get the gradient of colour in very specific places, I've really had to work in thin layers, building up the shadows and colour intensity over time. I've come to find that the way that I've created this face was definitely more difficult than it had to be. I feel as if in the future, it would be smarter to create the blue areas with an airbrush instead of using the pastels and pencils like I used. I came to find doing the method that I did, I had to start with a pencil base, apply pastel colours and then go over the entire thing with white soft pastels to remove that grainy effect that you get when you apply pastels and pencils on top of paint. 
Even though I'd based the head with an acrylic varnish and lacquer varnish, the graininess was still such a big issue in this face up, making me spend at least half the time just brushing white pastels over the face as I did with building up the colour.
For the eyes, I found it very difficult to achieve the look that I was after. I had to work off camera to develop the details with fine brushes and paint. I wanted dark eyes with very bright irises. After two days of working on it, I don't feel as if I've achieved the look that I was after, but it is what it is. Um, you can't be happy with it all, I suppose. Sealing all my work in with a final coat of varnish, it's time to move on to the hair. To create the hair, I'm going to be using 100% acrylic yarn, which I've brushed out and pressed with a hair straightener. The glue that I'm using is quick dry craft glue. In the original design of the character, I actually had no intention of adding hair. Instead substituting the hair for a sculpted head car carapace. I don't know how to say that word. <laughs> Similar to a head structure of Turians from Mass Effect and Togruda from Star Wars. But of course, like all things in my life, this lockdown in Sydney has impacted the design choice, causing me to go with something a lot simpler in design. I feel like a broken record at this point, talking about the lockdown. But as viewers of my channel know, I've been in lockdown in my house since mid-June. So of course it's impacted the running of the channel and all things that I create. In regards to how it impacted this creation, I knew that creating the carap carapace <laughs> would be a lot of trial and error. Using supplies that I know that I just can't simply reorder from local shops or anything like that. Unfortunately, this meant I had to sacrifice my ambitious design aesthetics for the reality. To make up for this, I really wanted to try my best to create a hairstyle that is truly regal. I wanted my character species to be deeply rich in their cultural attire, so I wanted this to be represented in the hair. Inspired by sci-fi characters such as Padme Amidala and Rio Chuchi from Star Wars, and Christian Avasarala from The Expanse, these characters all embrace the uniqueness of their cultures. No matter if they're in office or on the field, it's an intrinsic part of their identity. So of course I have to represent her deep cultural roots just through the hair with this iteration of the character. To mimic the shape of the original design's carap carapace, <laughs> I decided to make a floating braided headpiece that will adorn the top of the head. I braided some non-brushed out yarn into thin, tight sections that will be attached to the front of the head. Once I was happy with the placement and had a general idea of what I am wanting to achieve later on, it's time to wrap the head and move on to painting. For the painting of the spacesuit, I actually got some help from someone else. I don't know how to airbrush, 
but my partner does. So I enlisted his help for this one. He's a really talented painter in his own right. I would highly recommend checking out his work on Instagram under Apollo Painting. The link of course will be in the description below. Working layer by layer, he's going to paint the spacesuit. The idea is to make the suit a very dark colour, and then with various layers he'll start um, increasing the vibrancy of the blue that's going to be coming out. He did a fantastic ombre effect. This took about three hours, so I'm ridiculously grateful for his help. After letting it dry, here's the final result. I love it so much. Now it's my turn for the details. Using Scale 75's Eclipse Grey, I'm going to be going over all the naturally shadowed areas to emphasize this. Then using Vallejo's Deep Sky Blue and Normal Sky Blue, I'm gonna start doing edge highlights that'll frame the airbrushed ombre. To get even straight lines on the legs, I'm going to be using some tape to mask out the areas that I want to paint. At this point, my camera decided that Apollo was far more interesting than what I was doing. I feel extremely insulted. Adding in an accent colour, I'm going to be painting the spine and attachments in metallic silver. The paint that I'm using here is Citadel Canoptic Alloy.
For those sci-fi details, I thought it might be fun to add some little water decals to the design to really enhance that mech look of the spacesuit. Raiding my drawer of Evangelion, Gundam and Warhammer stickers, I landed on this Gundam and Ava Unit 8 decal set. Mapping out where I want the decals to be placed, I can start with the application. To apply the decals, you'll need water, Vallejo decal fix, and some Q-tips. Let's get started on the leg. Grabbing the decal that I'm going to be using first, I submerge it in some water. Then once it's all nice and damp, I'm going to be placing it on my finger, or the back of my hand, and just continue to wet it with the Q-tip. After about 30 seconds or so when I move the paper away, the decal should peel away and stick to the back of my hand. Before adding the decal to the surface, I'm going to just apply a layer of decal fix to the area. Then gently lift the decal away and place it on the leg. The decal fix takes, I think about a minute or so to dry, so it gives you enough time to just move the image into place. For the arms, I went with the AV Unit 8 metallic set to create a control panel-like design onto the suit. These are just classic stickers, so you don't have to wet them like the decals. For some added detail to the design, I'm just going to dot some bolts into the suit in the areas that I assume that they would be. Once I was happy with how everything was looking, I'm going to varnish it, but to give it a fantastically polished sci-fi look, I decided to go with acrylic gloss. It's so shiny, I love it, oh, I was so chuffed when I saw it dry, it looks so nice. With the painting done, the face done, and the hair, there's nothing left to do other than rig the body together. Grabbing some of that elastic from before, I'm going to carefully start threading the body together. Sometimes the smallest details are the most important. Removing the bag from the character's head, I can finally start to fix the hair and add this tiny little pearl to the forehead. This, of course, is a tiny little easter egg and nod to Omega from Star Wars' Bad Batch. Using Vallejo Gloss Varnish, a fine detail brush and a very steady hand, I'm going to start adding the gloss to the eyes and lips. To signify my character's place among the crew, it's time to add the badge, designed of course by Enchantarium, that I printed on my resin printer. With the badge added, my alien is complete. Introducing the botanist of our star crew, my alien, Eris.
Thank you all so, so much for watching. Let me know what you think of Eris in the comments below. Thank you to Dolightful for organising the collaboration. And thank you to Enchantarium and Dollinks for participating in it. This has honestly been such an enjoyable creation. And I'm so happy to finally be able to share it with you all. Of course, don't forget to check out Eris's amazing crew members on the other creators' channels. Everyone worked meticulously hard on this and it would mean the world if you checked them out. Links, of course, will be in the description below. Are you subscribed to the channel yet? Make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. I would honestly be so grateful. <laughs> Make sure to like the video if you like it and let me know what you think of the video in the comments below. I try to read all of your comments. A huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. It's through your support that I'm able to keep the channel going, so thank you. With that all being said, I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.